Um, welcome to the, the last talk of this um, morning session, as it's called here. Um, our um, last speaker is Sandro Geiken. Uh, Sandro is writing his PhD thesis in Bielefeld. He's been with uh, the CCC for about 10 years, loosely affiliated. And today he's talking about county development, the accessibility of technology as an addendum to engineering ethics in the knowledgeable society. Uh, now, um, he's already mm, regretted the choice of this title. Um, as I understand it, he's, he's going to talk about, well, how the interactions of politics, of participative politics and uh, technology, which I think is a topic that would deserve more listeners. But, well, maybe some people are yet to come. And still, it's two, so we, ha we need to start. And Sandro. It's, oh yeah. Uh, thank you for the introduction. Yeah, I've, as I already said, I regretted the long title, which was originally initiated for the uh, for my scientific audiences, because I'm giving the same talk on a couple of other conferences now in January too. But uh, I too late realized that it might be too unsexy for the Chaos Computer Club. And uh, I changed it now, however, for just for you, chosen audience, access to technologized politics, and you in particular, because I'm going to address you as technologist within this talk. Yeah, I'm, as uh, the chair already said, I'm a philosopher of technology at the Institute for Science and Technology Studies in Bielefeld. I'm largely doing epistemological stuff and science theory of the technical sciences, but I'm also engaged in the ethics of technology and uh, political theory of technology, political philosophy of technology. And today I'm going to talk about this. I'm going to present you with an argument on uh, why hacking, actually, which I will term a little different, uh, has to do substantially with uh, um, resistance as a fundamental access to uh, politics. And just to give you a brief outline of what I will be doing, First, um, as I said, my argument will rest on resistance, so first I will try to talk a little about resistance, what it is, and I will try to develop a notion of resistance as access to the social contract. Um, then I will talk about some very basic conditions of resistance which have to be fulfilled to let, allow resistance to be a meaningful concept. That will be the first part, first chunk of my talk about resistance. Then um, having these conditions in mind and a demand which can be followed from there, I will start to talk about um, political technologies, which uh, are techno as which I will understand technologies which are being involved in political actions, and we'll take a brief look at, uh, on what that actually means and how far technologies are able to alter political actions and to uh, give a different notion to them, uh, which is politically substantial as well. And uh, then we'll have a special look at what happens with uh, certain high-tech structures when high technologies are being introduced in politics. And uh, as a result of that second part, well, it will turn out that the basic conditions of resistance, which have been stated in the first part, um, cannot be guaranteed anymore when high technology is being introduced in, um, in uh, political technologies. And uh, that, of course, is a very bad situation. And so I will uh, uh, try to evaluate a little in the, in the, in the third part of my talk. Uh, how access to high-tech politics can actually be maintained and the concept which I will try to introduce here will be a counter-development. So to start, first of all, the notion of resistance as access to the social contract. Um, on a very basic level, we can view society, or many societies actually try to uh, have, have this uh, arrangement of ruling, which is that they appoint a certain class or type of rulers and uh, those are then <coughs> Those are then committed to act in their best interest and to do politics in their interest. And um, this commitment can be seen as somewhat of a contractual basis. Philosophy has termed this the social contract in many uh, different accounts. And the contractual basis somewhat consists of uh, a ruler being uh, committed to act in the best interest of his people. And this is, of course, accompanied by a couple of terms and conditions, which are then being stated in material forms, such as uh, constitutions and laws and electoral practices and stuff. And um, then, on the other hand, the, the, the ruled people who chose him are committed to obey to his ruling and to obey the laws which he gives out. So that is the social contract. And a very common form of, um, <clears throat> 
of uh, social organization. However, there's also a very common form of uh, breaching this contract on behalf of the ruler, and that is called uh, tyranny. Tyranny is somewhat the more ancient uh, word for this. The more uh, accurate word for now would be uh, dictatorship or somewhat. Um, but I like tyranny, so I stick to that. And a tyranny is uh, someone who has either usurped his post or who misuses his powers and is largely unimpressed by any legal means trying to abolish him or to dismiss him from his post again. And uh, if a ruler turns into a tyrant, then that is somewhat a worst case scenario for the social contract because the more powerful contractee uh, denies his commitments, denies the terms and conditions of the contract and um, then uh, and there's no no sort of upper uh, upper um, upper hand which could uh, rule then over him on and dismiss him if he just decides to uh, ignore these dismissals so um, a question of course is how to regain access to the social contract in such a worst case scenario and what we see in history was that what has happened is uh, that resistance in these cases comes up as a means for uh, the people to regain access to the social contract and to regain control over their ruler. So resistance is really a very important thing because it is sort of the ultima ratio, or the last means which is available to us if uh, our rulers turn into tyrants. And uh, now to get into this a little deeper, the, uh, I want to explore two dimensions of resistance, one theoretical dimension and one practical dimension. And the theoretical dimension can be discerned in certain legal and ethical considerations and arrangements. First of all, the legal arrangement is the right of resistance, the so-called right of resistance, that is to maintain the contractual form. Uh, it has been introduced in the Middle Ages already as, as a sort of natural justice, which is above the liege and above the king and uh, being initiated by, the, uh, by God. And uh, it stated that it was legitimate to remove a tyrant and even murder and uh, behead him if, uh, if that aims at restoring order and um, if it is the ultima ratio, if all other means have been uh, explored or tried out but didn't work, and if it uh, causes less damage than the tyrant would have and if it also has a fair chance of success. And in this shape, it is basically every citizen's right to pursue the right of resistance, and nowadays the right of resistance is also a formal right, a legal right, has a legal form in the Human Charter of, in the Charter of Human Rights, and it's also a very basic right uh, in, in many constitutions, as for instance in the German Constitution, it is uh, the Article 20, Paragraph 4, has been introduced in the, in the 68 student revolts to calm the public a little, and it states that all Germans have a right to resist anyone who undertakes it to remove the constitutionally secured order if no other means are available anymore. So this is really a very fundamental and basic thing. Uh, however, the legal form uh, alone doesn't suffice. There's also ethical evaluation involved in this and necessary for this, um, <clears throat> which basically has to do with finding the precise moment at which one should resist a certain ruling. Uh, the question is more or less when is the constitutionally secured order threatened really as a whole. And we can see that this, uh, there's space for this ethical evaluation already in the very formulation of the Article 24 because um, on the one hand it states that we should resist anyone who undertakes it to remove the constitutionally secured order which would point to the however faint beginnings of uh, such a removal. Whereas on the other hand it states that this is only legitimate when no other means are available anymore, which points to the very end of such a removal of the constitutionally or secured order. So um, one really has to find the, the, the very own and personal point of uh, point to depart into action in this somewhere between the very beginnings and the very end of uh, uh, the establishment of a dictatorship. I somewhat stick, like to stick with uh, early moral courage as for as John Taylor U.S. Senator 1821 has said, tyranny in form is the first step towards tyranny in substance. And this, I believe, is historically very warranted, so, but that's just a matter of personal taste. So that's a theoretical dimension of uh, resistance, but uh, we also know a lot of cultural practices of resistance, and they can be broadly um, categorized in the following way. First distinction runs between active and passive resistance. Active resistance is commonly known as everything which has to do with murder and mayhem, burning cars and dead people. 
uh, whereas passive resistance is a, a concept also known for long but only popular since Gandhi's Ahimsa movement who was very successful with this passive resistance thing, uh, which is resistance uh, which explicitly refrains from violence. And within the passive resistance we can also discern two other types of measures. Um, we can discern indirect measures which have no immediate bearing on the causal context they're concerned with and an example, a popular example for that would be Henry David Thoreau, the formal inventor of civil disobedience who was opposed to the American-Mexican War and to the treatment of the American natives but was in, in, uh, incapable of interfering directly with these stately affairs so he just uh, decided to withdraw his monetary support of the uh, of the state by refusing to pay tax so that is an indirect way of uh, um, of resisting certain rulings but there's also the the other type of direct measures which do have an immediate bearing on the cause of thing they're concerned with and how squattings or blockades can count as that and also of course Gandhi has given very popular examples as for instance he was opposing the British monopolies on textiles and sold by uh, just telling the Indian people to produce their own textiles and produce their own salt. So that was directly interfering with the thing it was concerned with. And uh, somewhat the passive direct measures are ethically preferable because as we have seen in the basic outline of resistance, what resistance it should do, it should cause less damage and have a good chance of success. And because passive direct measures have all the benefits of indirect measures like the drawing attention, demonstrating things, but also interfere directly with the, with the causal things they're concerned with, they're somewhat mostly more effective and somewhat ethically preferable in the general case, although of course the, um, uh, the evaluation has to be done individually for every uh, resistance, for the, every certain type of resistance has a, a specific individual set of consequences, of course. So to sum this up a little, um, as we have seen, resistance is in fact, despite to what the Borgs say, not useless, but a very important ultimate ratio to, uh, ex to regain access to the social contract in the worst case scenario of, the, this, of, the, of a ruler turning into a tyrant. And <clears throat> it does have some legal and ethical foundations and also some cultural practices in, uh, in humanity. And if we now look at resistance from a very, very basic point of view, um, we can see that this uh, relies on some very basic conditions which have to be fulfilled to make resistance actually a meaningful concept. For the legal and ethical evaluation, we have to, ha we have to, stay, we have to see that political measures have to be visible and intelligible to some extent because we have to be able to discern uh, certain political measures, political actions as illegitimate, as unconstitutional in the first place. And then we have to be able to clearly distinguish which intentions are behind there, who's involved and so on and so forth. And uh, so, in other words, to, um, uh, for resistance to be a meaningful concept and to, to, to the decide when to resist and to see when you have to resist, politics have to be cognitively accessible. And of course, this is not a trivial demand. It's largely known as well. I mean, the free independent press is largely concerned with trying to make political measures visible and intelligible, whereas PR agencies and secret services are trying to do the opposite. So this is a very basic condition which is already uh, involved in a certain degree of social struggle. And there's also another very basic condition which is, which is more concerned with the practice of resistance. And uh, for practical action, we have to uh, realize that political measures also have to have some physical outgrowth. And in the ethically preferable case of um, passive direct resistance, for instance, uh, it should be the physical outgrowth of the very measure uh, which is being undertaken. So the action itself should be physically accessible to some degree. Of course, this might seem like a very trivial thing to say because politics always do have some physical outgrowth. I mean, in the last, very last uh, case, it would be the, the very politician who decides these things. So uh, this appears to be a trivial condition, a trivial thing to state. But as we will see in, uh, as soon as high technologies become involved in politics, uh, this is not so trivial anymore. So um, these conditions really have to be uh, maintained and these conditions are important for, um, for resistance to have that as a meaningful concept. And we can state this a little, reformulate this a little into a meaningful demand in, uh, by saying that political measures have to be cognitively and physically accessible. And we can see, I already stated the free independent press and some other groups, activists of course as well, are engaged in a social struggle to keep politics cognitively and physically accessible 
already. Uh, we've also seen the the forming of social groups like free independent press and and the and activists. And however, the technologists have been very absent from this social struggle as an explicit social group by an, uh, un until now. But I believe that this cannot be uh, upheld any longer and that the technologists as a group should really engage in the social struggle to maintain the conditions for resistance. And I will explore this now when I uh, will uh, start to look at what it means if technology is being introduced in political actions. And uh, I'm trying to phrase, this is really a, a, a research which I will do in the next five years in my, in my habilitation to try and look at political technologies, the entanglements of politics and technology. I uh, find that very interesting. There is also a uh, talk has started on this in uh, sociology of technology, history of technology, under the term of uh, technologized politics, a little just over the past years. And, but I will try to focus more on the technologies because I'm a philosopher of technology, so that is my angle and um, we'll understand these as the technologies of po technologized politics. And the definition, which I have just um, brought, causally stated now, will be that a political technology is a technology which is a substantial part of some political measure, and maybe standardization can be taken as an indicator for certain technology being a substantial part. But um, I do agree that this is still cause, and one could uh, um, argue whether the uh, whether a certain pencil of a specific type which is being standardized for filling out form XYZ is in the same way substantial as a long-range nuclear missile is substantial for foreign politics. or But uh, that's still an open thing. But somewhat the, uh, this is just a working definition. And the interesting question which can now be followed with, with, would be that if whether the introduction of technologies actually alters political actions in any politically substantial sense. This is actually the question which I will ask myself for the next five years and try to go in there a little deeply. For now, I don't have really a very very worked out concept. I just have a, a couple of ideas and this uh, threefold dimensions, uh, which I will uh, just briefly present you now. Values, effectivity, exclusivity. Uh, values in technology uh, is um, a thing that the Chaos Computer Club notoriously denies. Uh, they always say that technologies are not evil, they're neutral. But uh, in fact, I believe that technologies are never neutral. And uh, I think one way of seeing this is that uh, a very easy thing to approach by saying that a technology is always involved in some sort of action, some human action. We always do something with technologies. And when we do something, we have aims in our head. And when we have aims, then these aims rest on some needs and values. And needs, of course, can be reformulated as values. And as such, we find a systemic net of values and needs in every single technology by just what we what we be able to do with that and how it is being developed and produced. And you can see this easily in any sort of car. If you drive a Corvette Stingray, for instance, your your ultimate need is not to come from A to B because then you would probably buy a different car, but also to impress uh, people and to show off how uh, rich you are and how fast. So um, there's always a net of values and needs embodied in any technology, and even if comfort uh, uh, can be counted as, as a value, which is, seems to be very prevalent in, in current, uh, certain, uh, current <coughs> technological development. And one question which has, has much to do with my talk now, which, which I find intriguing, is whether one could try and develop a notion of a global web of values and needs and can illustrate and contrast that with the, uh, the global web of values and needs as they are realized by technologies. And just to give you an idea what that could be about is um, if you, for instance, just see how much money is being invested in the tiny little details which nobody needs in our gadgets, and you contrast that with the money which is being invested in the development of devices to clean water, which would be very substantially needed by uh, quite a few uh, yeah, people to actually survive then you can see that there's a huge difference of actual values which should be pursued in technological development and which are quite asymmetric to uh, the values which are being pursued by technological development. But that's just an idea for the future. Yeah, another thing is the effectivity of technology. Of course, what technology usually does is technology enhances certain actions or technology enables certain actions, as in the case of flying. We wouldn't be able to fly without airplanes. So. These are, of course, the standard things which technology do. They somewhat uh, add something to our actions. 
And um, another point is also exclusivity of technology, that is, uh, that technology of a certain uh, step of uh, development is only manageable by experts, and that it is, of course, only affordable by the rich or powerful, which uh, applies in particular to greater technological compounds and stuff like that. And also the directions of development are, of course, given by those people rich and powerful enough to afford experts. And these are things which have to do with politics as well. And in which way can be seen now, we can discern some immediate dangers now if we see these effects of technology being uh, carried over and embodied into politi politics, political actions. We can then see that political technologies are actually quite able to realize nasty values uh, within political actions, and these are especially tricky when they're, when they're somewhat contradictory, as uh, contradictory values, for instance, are control and freedom, or security and freedom, or uh, profit and labor, because if you try to enhance the one thing, then you automatically uh, seem to, I mean, it's not a necessity, but you seem to have to diminish the other things. So. That's something which political technologies can do and which they can introduce into the political ac actions. Then another difficult thing they could do, of course, is that they could <coughs> enhance or enable illegitimate political measures um, in this effectivity thing. And another thing would be that they could also be managed, owned, and developed by politically strongly biased people, which, of course, has been the case in the voting computer uh, industry in the U.S., which has been uh, determined by Diebold, which are strongly politically biased towards the Republicans. So uh, this is just a brief outlook to just really state this very uh, basic thing now that we can say that all these things seem to point to the fact that political technologies can actually be a very substantial part of political action and can be uh, can alter politics in some sense or another. So uh, that would be. Uh, natural thing to assume and we can now renew our demand, the demand I have stated on, on political actions uh, for the case of political technologies that political technologies should be cognitively and physically accessible too. However, we now encounter immediate problems when we look at certain high-tech structures, when, when polit politics are actually being interspersed with uh, high technologies. And I'm just wanting, uh, I just want to highlight three basic structural components of high technologies. Uh, the first component is intelligence. We see intelligence, a strong increase in intelligence in our daily lives in, in many aspects. Uh, another philosopher has term, termed this the logical malleability of technological devices and uh, which are being intelligent. And this has a twofold effect. The first effect is that uh, it is, of course, handy for us to have devices which are able to think and to do things for us while we're away or to uh, interact with us, so it's it's uh, quite a natural thing to develop ever more intelligence into ever more devices of our daily life. And the other effect is that our own intelligent processes, our cognitive processes, can be uh, supported by intelligence, uh, and thus ever more of our own intelligent processes are being technologized in a way. Like when I use this PowerPoint thing here, and that helps certain cognitive processes of mine to be visualized, and so thus I have outsourced a part of my intelligent processes into a technology. And these two effects um, really have the effect that intelligence is being embodied into ever more processes, daily procedures, our cognitive processes, daily life, and ever more things that will be an unstoppable uh, thing for the future. And the danger, of course, is that you never know which whose intelligence actually is there in detail, because uh, intelligence, of course, might invite foreign interests and agendas, and by uh, by this interspersion of um, intelligence with our daily lives, these foreign interests and agendas might just be introduced in a very subtle way. Uh, a second feature which has to do with intelligence, of course, is complexity. Complexity is uh, so far complicated as uh, it makes high-tech structures or high technologies very hard to understand or to control for lay people and sometimes also impossible to understand or control at all, which is to say that even experts will not be able to uh, fully reconstruct what's, what's happening in a computer uh, down to the very last detail. Or uh, this applies even more to the case of genetic engineering or to nanotechnology, where the basic fundamentals are not understood at all, and the complex interactions with the uh, natural surroundings are not understood at all and, and cannot be controlled. And... Um, 
so that is a very difficult uh, structural feature of high technology as well. And uh, third and last um, difficult structure on, in high technology is virtuality as well, which is difficult in two respects. On the one hand, uh, one difficulty is that your local branch of technology shares a universally accessible virtual space when it is a communicative technology of some sort then uh, you, that means that you are accessible from uh, the virtual space, your local branch is accessible from the virtual space. And of course we all know what the implications of this are as far as surveillance is concerned. And another feature of virtuality is that it also makes certain technical procedures partly unphysical. As um, uh, you, you might not be able to physically directly interfere with somebody who's intercepting your communication because it's just happening entirely out of your bounds. And the same feature of unphysical virtuality somewhat also, also applies to technologies which are simply beyond our reach, such as uh, satellite surveillance satellites or stuff like that. So if we now take into account these structures and we see what happens when high technology is being introduced into politics, then we can see that high political, uh, high, high political technologies can actually render political actions in very bad ways. They can make them biased by introducing foreign interests and foreign agendas into these politics. Um, they can make them invisible by, because uh, they can hide them in the complexity of the apparatus. They can make them uh, unintelligible almost instantaneously because only experts will be able to reconstruct what actually is happening and who is interested in what and who is biased in which way. So that really becomes a very complicated thing in complex high technologies. And they can also render certain political actions entirely unphysical and physically very hard for us to access. And one example is the Vorratsdatenspeicherung. Uh, What's that in English, actually? Data retention. data retention, yeah. One very nice example is data retention, which is, uh, which is an, a, a process entirely unphysical to us because we have no direct uh, uh, possibility to interfere with that in any physical way. And uh, now, if we now remind ourselves of the demand we have stated that politics should be cognitively and physically accessible and that also political technologies should be cognitively and physically accessible, we can now see that the introduction of high technologies into politics um, renders them cognitively and physically inaccessible. And that, of course, is a very dangerous situation. And we can also discern two different types of inaccessibilities. One, I want to term partial inaccessibility, uh, as it applies only to lay people who are not experts in the technical fields and not able to reconstruct these things on their own without a certain degree of expertise. And another inaccessible ability which is even more dangerous is full inaccessibility in cases where these technologies are even not accessible by experts anymore. So as, as a consequence, of course, we have to state that um, Full, uh, fully inaccessible technologies as a really a worst case scenario of entirely uncontrollable and unintelligible technologies and uh, or parts of political actions have to be uh, avoided as deeply dystopian in politics at all costs. And actually dystopian literature for, for me is always a very good uh, back, backdrop to analyze these things because uh, most dystopian uh, scenarios are really concerned with technologies which have become inaccessible and which somewhat determine the political cause of, uh, of life. And one very early example, dystopian example, would be the automatic doomsday machine which the Russians have invented in Kubrick's Dr. Strangelove, which is inaccessible then once it is initiated and so on and so forth. <coughs> So um, that is the demand which would apply to fully inaccessible technologies. But the, the thing which we have to be concerned with uh, more narrowly in our daily basis will be partially inaccessible technologies, technologies which are not accessible to the lay public. Of course, they should be avoided too in political actions, but due to this feature of logical malleability, they will, we will not be able to avoid them and they will just, this will just simply happen. And uh, what we have to do then in this case would be to recover the accessibility. And uh, these are largely technical tasks, of course, to say that, to, to realize when a technology is fully inaccessible is a technical task and can only be done by somebody who knows technology and who, who knows what's happening and going on there. And also the, um, to recover accessibility is also a technical task because you have to understand this and be able to, to translate it and to do something against it. And this path of how to do this, how to come to avoidance and restoration is a, a, a concept which I'm trying to develop now, which many of you of course do already, but this is now 
uh, in the context I have developed. And uh, I've termed it counter-development because it's somewhat uh, the, the development against evil development, so uh, it counters something. And the core concept of counter-development will, will consist out of these three demands. The first demand will be to restore visibility, and that will entail to alarm the lay public about the presence of technologies and politics whenever that is the case, which is really just basically to, to get visibility of these things in the first place. And that will have to be accompanied by the second demand to restore intelligibility, to enlighten the public about the specific workings of these machines, of these high technologies, of the functions, of the potentials, the dystopian potentials, uh, whenever these are introduced into politics and how they could actually alter the politics and bias them and do things with them. And then the third demand, which is uh, more controversial, especially among my uh, philosopher colleagues, is that we should also be concerned with restoring the physicality of these things. Uh, and namely, countermeasures should be developed to any uh, political technologies which are potentially, even potentially, uh, questionable to make them accessible again in any case of misuse by any tyrant. So uh, we really would have to supply sabotage devices or sabotage guides to the lay public to allow them to disable features which uh, suppress them in, in uh, highly technologized politics. Uh, yeah, then these three demands then directly aim at restoring what we have uh, discerned in the first part as the basic conditions for resistance. If we follow these, then visibility and intelligibility can be restored and politics will be made cognitively accessible and physicality can be uh, restored as well to make politics also, again, physically accessible. Um, however, there will be some uh, more, and um, I, I haven't gone into these too deeply, but there will be some more demands as well uh, entailed or uh, implied by counter-development. The, uh, the fourth would, of course, be concerned with these full, full inaccessibilities, that dystopias have to be destructed, full inaccessibilities have to be pointed out explicitly, and uh, removed is if necessary, if nobody acts on them. And uh, another more general demand, of course, would be to raise some sort of general awareness, which is a demand which would more apply to the meta-technical community, people like me, or sociologists, historians, politicians of technology, to enlighten the public about the general implications and entanglements of politics and technology, and what happens and how inevitable disasters and some things, some developments are when, when these things happen. For instance, uh, as uh, history has shown is that technologies which are once introduced in certain types of political actions are never ever being removed again. That's a very uh, disturbing fact and the public should really be enlightened about the role technology plays in politics because I do not think that they really realize how, um, how devastating they can be uh, within politics. So, um, and now this all applies to you uh, here in the audience personally very much because Counter-development, well, if we now say that counter-development is somewhat a necessity, is a necessary thing to guarantee an ongoing access to politics in the ITEC age, because counter-development is the only thing that uh, allows us to restore accessibility and make resistance as the last means to access the social contract, a meaningful concept again, uh, then this is largely your job. I mean, counter-development can only be done by the technical community. The lay public cannot do this. And uh, this renders somewhat the technical community into a social group which has to be engaged in the social struggle over, the, uh, over these accessibilities. And what we would probably need would be something an equivalent to the free independent press in terms of technologists. We would need something like the free independent technologist who is able to translate uh, what is happening in, in technologies into understandable concepts to make these things visible. And in addition to what the press does, the press only does this translation thing. Uh, the free independent technologies and technologists should also provide countermeasures, really physical things to counteract uh, certain high-tech political actions. And as such, from a philosophical point of view, counter-development is really an ethical obligation for every individual technological expert. So that has been my argument largely. I just want to go through it again for you to, as a reminder now for the discussion. Uh, we have stated that political measures have to be physically and cognitively accessible to allow resistance as access to the social contract and worst case scenarios. Uh, then we have seen that high technologies introduce partial or full inaccessibilities into political measures or are capable of doing so and thus alter political measures in a very substantial way. And uh, we have then 
stated that full inaccessibilities, of course, have to be avoided and partial inaccessibilities have to be removed by counter-development. And uh, by realizing that counter-development really is a technical task, we were also able to state that counter-development is a new ethical duty for the technical community. Okay, so this has been my talk here, my presentation. There's also an article coming up on this uh, topic, counter-development, forthcoming in the International Journal of Technology, Knowledge and Society, which will appear in, as, I don't know, February, March sometime. Uh, but I, I can also send you a slightly different uh, version of that. If you're interested, you can just send me an email and I'll send it to you in, as a PDF. And uh, thank you. Well, thank you, Sandro. Any questions, comments? Um, so you say a lot of about... Uh, uh, cognitive things and about the physical things, but what do you think about uh, emotions? I think uh, emotions are really uh, so. You must, we must uh, to understand it or to <laughs> what 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 we want uh, what we have to do with emotions in uh, this shame of oh. What do you think how uh, how technologies manipulate people emotionally or, or what do you uh, I don't think it's so simple that manipulate uh, who is manipulated and so and I can say it now but I think uh, that uh, you are drawing a really uh, interesting uh, uh, pictures but so but uh, I don't understand uh, where uh, which role have the emotions in this uh, theory so I think that's because of the uh, social life is not only with the cognitive things you not only think and feeling is not only physical mm. I think not physical like a touch but emotional mm. so and yeah well um, I mean that would go really deeply into this uh, phenomenology of technologies stuff which is uh, the philosophical discussion on how we live with technologies and how we how we actually mix and uh, Bit form is synthesis. Of, I, know, I mean, I know you're a sociologist of technology, but I don't really, I don't really understand the concept of how to em embody this into politics. Maybe we just have to talk about that later. Mm. I don't have a picture now. Okay, I, I just say it for for all because of I think uh, like a uh, iPod is sexy, and so it's uh, it's not a cognitive thing, and uh, okay, it's yeah. a really, but it's really uh, uh, important. Yeah, yeah <laughs> okay. you have to explain that to me later. I don't get it now. Further questions, contributions? Okay, um, thank you for your talk. Um, I would like to make some more explicit links to talks that have been made on the first day. Um, you talked about the, the voting computers, um, the talk that was given by um, Rob. Uh, I can't pronounce his uh, surname, so I won't do it. Um, and um, how we need accessibility and visibility, and I think if we uh, think about voting computers and how they actually make the the voting itself, the whole vote, um, yeah, inaccessible to some kind and unintelligible for people who don't understand computers. I think that's that's a very important point. So that's a point where we should oppose such things as uh, voting computers and voting uh, electronic voting, for example, as well. Uh, so that would be, um, yeah, I would totally support your argument there, and. Um, there has been another talk on the first day about data retention. So you mentioned data retention already by Ulrich Wiesner. And um, he was talking about how we um, give up a lot of uh, freedom with data retention, for example, um, to gain only a little bit of security. And um, I think what is the problem here, too, um, what Ulrich uh, pointed out was that most of the politicians don't really understand why they use the technology and um, that they use the technology but they don't really um, see what they're doing to the public with it. They only have certain aims in their mind but they don't really see what, uh, yeah, what, what these aims or what the means they use for it also imply. So that would be um, another way to support your argument there. But it also um, points to the fact that, um, or I would like to point to the fact that um, we need not only to inform the public, but also the politicians at that point. 
um, they make use of political technologies or technology in general, but uh, yeah, they don't really see what's happening with this technology or what they what it implies, what it all uh, like all the implications. So um, yeah, I would like to add to your argument that we need to inform the politicians as well. And um, my last question would be: um, You said that technology is never neutral. Um, I think it, we need to use technology as well. So, um, as a means, as a means for doing something, it might be neutral, but um, we use it for different aims. So, I wouldn't necessarily say that um, technology is evil or bad or something, or never neutral. But that the aims we use them for are never neutral. So, if we, for example, um, counter development, you might also term it as hacking, for example. Um, we sort of use the technology for a different aim. So we might have like a, a left-wing aim and the politicians might have a right-wing aim, but we use the same technology. So um, yeah, I would oppose that because um, it sort of um, it uh, enhances technophobia, I think. And we as the um, technologists, as you say, Make also, also make use of technology, so we uh, shouldn't uh, enhance technophobia at that point. Mm. And um, I'm talking too much, sorry. <laughs> and <laughs> and um, the last point I would like to make is um, I'm not a, a totally computer expert. I wouldn't fit into your category of uh, the uh, independent technologist, but as a person who is dealing with technology and using technology, I can still say at some point, oh, I don't understand this. and I don't understand what's going on. And I think that's something that everyone can do. Every person who's using technology or um, who's um, at some point not understanding what's happening. So I wouldn't restrict it to these free independent uh, technologists, but also to all the people who say, I'm dealing with this and I don't understand it and that's bad for me because I don't know what's going on. And yeah, then the free independent technologists come into play and they should yeah, explain what's going on. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, sure. No, totally. I'll just to uh, hook on to that. Then, of course, of course, everybody should be concerned with this, but we do know, uh, but we do need the technical community in the first place to realize just what's going on. I mean, and what is going on. I mean, you, you do need some information about voting computers, for instance, by Rob, or you do need some background information on data retention to actually uh, just realize that this is dangerous in the first place because there's too much going on which you don't uh, don't understand or don't see anyway, so you have to direct your, uh, your attention to something, and that is something which the technical expert has to decide somewhat for you to say that this is more dangerous than the, I don't know, the um, harvesting machine which is being built there next door. <coughs> then the other point, of course, what you said on um, that, com for instance, uh, technologies can be used by the bad guys and by the good guys, and thus they're neutral, that's the very standard philosophical argument for the neutrality of technology, of course, and has been opposed in many ways. But uh, one, one way it would be to say that technologies have a tendency to lend themselves towards certain things. Uh, another thing is to say that they, uh, you, you also have to distinguish the different dimensions of use, production and development. Because then production and development are also guided by certain aims and values and those go into the technology as well. As for instance, I have uh, computers for instance, uh, uh, sem semiconductors. And uh, semiconductors are the most poisonous thing to, to produce at the moment, are only being produced in very poor countries by people which uh, in companies which don't have to uh, apply come to any work laws and the people who are working there are, are very sick and get cancers all the time. And so these values go into these machines as well, you know, there's, there's blood on my computer, so to speak. But, um, but that's a diff difficult argument uh, anyway, this neutrality of technology. It's just a personal matter of taste, more or less, if you wanna, uh, want to um, accept that or not. I don't. And then uh, your other point to, to uh, raise awareness within politicians, that's, that's of course a very important thing. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm, thank you for that uh, thing. <laughs> Well, I've put me on the speaker's list for a second. Um, one thing that um, raised a bit of alarm for me was um, your um, 
your point about the complexity that need, needed to be reduced to get the layman or to, to provide accessibility to laymen. Well, as a um, fan of enlightenment, not the window manager, the historical period, I would, I would rather say, um, wouldn't it be better in this particular case to um, see this from the, or to, to try to change this from the people side rather than from technology side. I agree that certain technologies can be made more accessible, but I think once you deny there is complexity and once you leave the, leave the people who use the technology out of the picture and just try to make technology accessible by dumbing it down, you probably lose quite a bit. And I think, um, a fan of enlightenment would have to say, well, let's educate the people. Let's educate the people. Let's, let's change technology as well. Let's make it more transparent. Uh, let's make it, um, well, uh, Debian is more, more transparent than Windows maybe because you can really see what's going on. That's a, f that's a good thing. But don't, uh, let's resist the, the temptation to dumb technology down to just to provide the illusion, and I think it would be an illusion of accessibility. What do you think about that? Well, I don't know. I mean, we're talking about the, the case of the introduction of uh, technology into politics here. And, uh, <coughs> and I think in, within politics, we should try to maintain a certain simplicity because only simplicity can really fully guarantee transparency and, and, uh, and uh, intelligibility for everyone because otherwise not everyone will care about this complexity thing. And um, a good case in point is, is the voting computer. Why on earth would we abandon the system with just making a cross on a, on a piece of paper and three people checking it? It's much more easy, it's very simple, and it's a political process which is very important and which can be disturbed very much by the introduction of a computer in there. So um, I would say that the general, I, I would just state that as a preference, if it is possible to have a simple thing rather than a complex thing, and if that, that isn't associated with any substantial loss of, uh, of value or of, of whatever you want to achieve with that, then I would uh, generally prefer the simple, simple case over the complex one. And in the other case, of course, you're right, we should just, just maintain the complex thing and then enlighten people about the complexities in there and uh, try to maintain uh, transparency as good as possible. Choices determining technological development uh, very often happen um, by political choices, um, which are not public, publicly debated, um, if not by business. Um, one good instance of that would be uh, spectrum and broadcasting technologies, because uh, having chosen one type of regulation, basically one type of technology was chosen, which had certain incumbents behind it. So um, I think that uh, in in this day and age, uh, a very po important point would be to um, create uh, an imperative of ac accountability by political um, uh, uh, political uh, structures when they make uh, technological choices, because those are uh, things that produce basically uh, the dominant technological environment. And um, those are the points where public can, within uh, a constituted political environment, so uh, an ordinary uh, or ordered political environment, uh, intervene into uh, technological choices which are being made. And they are not being made only for the sake of technology. And a second point is that those choices oftentimes happen indirect through means of optimization. I mean, uh, voting machines uh, were chosen f primarily through this logic of optimization. Um, and uh, this also has to be increasingly accounted on. So I think that we should also strive towards a redefinition of how political structures or structures of political decision making make technological choices and make those things um, account or points in the s structure account for the choices they make. So particularly when it comes to optimization, I think that 
it's it's a strong argument which oftentimes uh, does away with the political debate as to what technologies we choose or not. Mm. Yeah, no, totally. I'm, I totally agree with this. Maybe I should uh, make that as a sub uh, point of this raise awareness thing as well that um, <clears throat> politics should be aware, of course, of the, of the values and needs which are being introduced also by optimization, as you said, because optimization in itself has some certain values and then also is able to carry other values in there. And of course, it should be uh, made more uh, aware to the politicians that they are not only just optimizing a certain kind of process, but also uh, uh, gambling with values in these cases. So I totally agree with your point. Okay. <clears throat> I'd like to ask about um, definitions of control. And the reason I want to ask about that is to question what you were saying about how the technologists are the kind of respons responsible agents for the counter development. And I would look at like privacy enhancing technologies as in um, anonymizers or the free net as also political technologies. I don't know if you see it as such. And in a way, these technologies are about avoiding processes of control by introducing other ways of control. So if you look at cryptography um, or even, you know, um, anonymizer itself, um, most pets are actually control mechanisms. So um, I wonder if there is a positive and negative definition of control. I don't know. Uh, or is there another way of defining security or abolishing security or deconstructing security, which as a technologist I cannot do. But I would expect, for example, somebody who's read lots of Foucault to be able to give me some feedback, which I haven't done. But I'm just wondering if you have different definitions of control and security, which would help technologists' questions, mechanisms of control, or to produce technologies that do something else. Um, that subvert or our counter developments. I think without these ideas, it's d difficult to develop technologies as well. So it's a cooperation. Yeah, yeah, thank you for that remark. Actually, yeah, that's quite true. I mean, um, there would have to be some sort of proactive uh, version of counter development because I formulated it very negatively here in a way to, uh, uh, to more trying to disturb and destruct certain uh, developments and, and things. but. Uh, of course, uh, like these privacy things which are trying to put co a, a certain type of control uh, to control these other people who are trying to control something else, um, would have to be introduced there, which would be, of course, a case to uh, an example for restoring physicality in this sense, to try to uh, make your communication uh, non-interceptable and uh, to give you back the control. But uh, I totally agree. Maybe I should... Uh, make my argument more fine-grained there and add this as some sort of a proactive uh, thing. But I don't know if we do need to, yeah, yeah. maybe my notion of control was somewhat negative. I, I didn't intend that. I should probably formulate that a little more neutral. But thank you. Uh, I would like to add that I'm uh, also in favor of uh, reducing complexity in our stuff more than um, educating people. Of course, I'm all, always in favor of educating people and enlightening them. That's, of course, always a very good thing to do and also an um, important thing. But um, one thing is I believe that our technology has, uh, and, and culture using it has advanced too far for the average person to be able to understand things. And it's just uh, too big a demand that people are educated um, in a way that, for example, would them allow to understand the inner workings of a voting machine. Um, and I mean, I'm not even able to educate myself uh, as much as I would like to and I think it's needed. So I think it's a very tough job to educate other people um, if you can't even do it to yourself enough. And I think there's a bit of a danger of, uh, of um, abuse if you say that people uh, should be educated or if, if one, one demands that people should be educated about the te high technology because um, it could be said that, well, our technology is so complex, it has to be, you just have to understand it. And if you don't, then go educate yourself and we will use it uh, in the time being and you don't have to understand it because we are the experts. And that is uh, a danger because that's, that's a thing I think uh, it should just not be accepted. It has to be simple and it has to be made simple and if it, uh, the technology is too complex inherently, then it cannot be used for these political means like the voting computer, for example. Um, even if it would save lots of money and be uh, fast and whatever, uh, if it is inaccessible, and I think this is a case of full inaccessibility, because uh, even the experts uh, needed to, 
to do very hard uh, and long reverse engineering to get to know what really goes on. So nobody really can know in, uh, in any normal or acceptable way. So this just has to be avoided. And if it's um, more expensive and uh, slower to count all the votes by hand, which actually uh, it doesn't seem to be, uh, then we just have to accept that and do it because it's, uh, well, that's just not that important as the uh, understandability of the things by the people. Mm. Yeah. Uh, yeah, sure. I mean, that's the that's, um, really thing I'm, I'm a lot in favor of. I mean, this one thing about uh, enlightening the people, I have I've tried to, um, I'm still on it, trying to do a project within the Chaos Computer Club which aims at precisely providing understanding and, and precise manuals for the public on how these, these, these things understand to provide these translations. And the idea I had for that was to be to give like two different versions. Like the one version would, would just be uh, very coarse and very, uh, very easy understandable. Like uh, if you use this technology then this and this crap could happen. Um, because of this and these, these and these uh, certain things in a very broad and coarse functional language, and then also to provide the more detailed account of what could happen for anybody who is interested, in fact, to get into the details more narrowly. So um, that would just be a matter of procedure and within counter development how you could actually uh, just, you know, provide different versions of these things to make that make it still maintain it as interesting for the public. And then another thing which you have addressed was that um, there might be abuse of this, and I'm fully aware of of, uh, of the potential of abuse once you uh, uh, give countermeasures to the public that there will always be some guy who is fully making full use of that just because he was pissed off with some bureaucrat or something. But I think that that is a very nice thing actually because it renders the introduction of um, technology into politics uh, quite impossible and quite uh, dangerous for the politicians and so they will think uh, thrice about doing it. That's just my point. Okay, we have time for another question, I guess. It's just a small <coughs> question. Um, the most surprising thing for me was the physical uh, accessibility of the technology. Um, in, in the case of the voting computer, it's quite uh, quite easy to see that there is a thing that you can access and you can beat upon it. But uh, if we think about data retention or uh, retention or things like that, um, it's not only the technology but also the data that isn't uh, physically accessible. And are there uh, concepts to relate the the technology and the data that's been gathered with the technology or stored by technology on the one hand and the other hand how do I have to uh, imagine physical accessibility in those cases mm, yeah uh, I don't know how to really formulate the contact connection between technology and, and data because I'm, I'm not a technologist my I, I'm a meta technologist but not really a hacker I do not know anything about these things in, in any greater detail I could tell you some nice philosophical theories about it later, but uh, um, and uh, yeah, I mean, what we really need some is uh, is to this sort of physical accessibility. I mean, another term to phrase this would be sabotage. To simply, what we have to do is to provide uh, sabotage devices for any sort of uh, procedures or processes which are pot potentially politically biased or which have a tendency to lean themselves to uh, bad dystopian political scenarios. So that, I mean, that's like the core idea I have in my subversive mind in the back to really, that's, and that would be like also uh, as this, uh, as uh, you said, to have a proactive uh, thing of this in mind as well, not just to uh, to disturb certain things uh, or to avoid or to, to refrain from using communication because it can be intercepted, but also to uh, sabotage uh, your opponent by different, a number of different means. Yeah, maybe a comment. Um, we should, in, in a way, I, I think we, we should try to live with the fact that we already, since so long time, we delegated part of the of our lives to experts so technology is just another field but since so many years we delegated our health to to doctors we trust them in a way the fact that maybe maybe the fact that they are enough 
the, 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 they have enough doctors on the market and they not always agree one with, uh, with, with the other gives us a kind of access to what they say and con contradict and stuff like this. But uh, still we don't really understand what they say and what they do to ourselves. Uh, on the other side, maybe uh, uh, about the access to technology, uh, I don't know where is the balance to find between, I, I would say, just to give an image, uh, if you have television, state-controlled television with just one channel and you have only the government programs, and then after we liberalized it, we gave many channels to people and the remote control, they, are, they choose to watch Fame Academy. Uh, we should try to, 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 to learn to live with. Also, not everybody wants to be educated. So. Yeah, um, yeah. Thank you for this comment. That's that's uh, true, of course. But th I mean, this whole discussion is really going on in this uh, whole big chunk of uh, debates about the knowledgeable society and about the impact of experts in a society which consists and decides uh, exceedingly more based upon scientific opinion and expert opinion. So uh, I think that is a general feature of our society. It does not only grow more complex in the field of uh, medicine or in the field of technology. It grows more complex everywhere because everything is being uh, transcended by scientific knowledge. And um, But I do believe that this, this idea I had about uh, having free independent uh, technologists, or free independent experts in general, who are trying to produce unbiased uh, translations of complex going-ons uh, is a very important thing in there, too, because one, one pr big problem in the knowledge of a society is that we do have a lot of fake experts. I mean, we do have all, all sorts of politicians employ their own experts, and they tell them in advance what they're supposed to find out. I mean, in the U.S., you have really terrible uh, scenarios. You have this Cato Institute, which is a totally right-wing think tank, and they have idiots like Thomas Moore in there who's being paid by the petrol, by the oil industry, to uh, produce large amounts of data which state that global warming is a very nice thing indeed and we should support our industry but in, in producing more carbon dioxide. And then the, the bad thing, of course, is that the politicians say, hey, we have this other guy, he says entirely different things, so we decide independent of your expert opinion. And so I believe that this thing, the idea of having free independent experts and establishing these free independent experts within society as some sort of a an institution in the same way we have the free independent press is a very important thing. Okay, we've run out of time. You can talk to Sandro uh, in person, I guess. He'll, he'll be here for some time. Have a nice morning break and um, let's uh, thank Sandro again. Thank you.